Hey everybody, I want to welcome you again to our online worship service. So glad to have you with us. Um, in just a moment, we're going to start worshiping, and I love this opening song we're doing. We've sung it many times before. It's called Unstoppable God. And I just want you to pause before we start worshiping. Is there something in your life that you feel is too big? Uh, something that is too overwhelming? Something that maybe keeps you up tonight? something that causes you sleepless nights. As we sing this first song together, my prayer is that you be reminded that we have an unstoppable God. And we are here to glorify Him with our very lives. And it only requires the faith of a mustard seed to move a mountain. So as we worship together, my prayer is that you'd use this opening song to remind yourself not about how big your problems are, the things that are overwhelming to you, but of how big and how unstoppable our God is. But before we start singing together, why don't you do what we've been asking you to do uh, every week and reach out to somebody right now. Let them know that you're thinking about them, praying for them, and that you wish you were with them. So why don't you do that right now and we'll come back together with Unstoppable God.
Hello everybody, it's Pastor Steve here. I am the children's pastor at North Lake Community Church and it is a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Well, we're in the middle of a series focused on the promises of God. And so as I got ready to prepare for today, I kind of asked myself the question, well, what, what really is a promise? You know, um, if you're like me, I, I grew up learning to use the phrase, I promise, to just kind of emphasize that I really meant something. Mom, can I have some cookies? I promise I'll eat my dinner. Or maybe, Dad, I'm sorry I left the tools laying out in the yard last time, but if you let me use them again, I promise I'll put them away. Or maybe even this one. I'm sorry, officer. I didn't realize how fast I was driving. I promise to slow down from here on out. As a kid, if you really wanted to emphasize that your promise was a real promise, what would you say? I pinky promise, right? Or maybe even, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Remember that one? If we really, really want to emphasize something and, and be emphatic about it, we might even use the term, I swear. As a matter of fact, in our legal system, people are required to swear uh, as they get ready to speak. That's how we know that no one will ever lie in court, right? Or how we know that politicians will always uphold the Constitution and they'll uh, defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. It's amazing how just making the right statement causes people to always say and do the right thing. Yeah, right, yeah. But what is a promise really? The Google definition of, of a promise is a declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will happen. I think that sounds about right. When we look at God's promises, we don't ever see him adding extra pizzazz to try and make us really believe him. I mean, can you imagine looking through scripture and seeing, come to, you, to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I pinky promise. That's ridiculous, right? Now, there are times where we see Jesus say, truly, truly, I say unto you, or if you like the King James, verily, verily, I say unto thee. But in those places, he's not really saying that as a way of saying, hey, this is really true this time. What he's really trying to do is get the attention of who's listening. Listen, kind of like a way of saying, listen, 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 Linda. You guys. Okay, Linda. Linda, listen, Be listen, 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 you listen, listen, Linda. Listen. Okay, what? You know, that's the sort of thing there. Jesus always told the truth. Everything that we read in God's word that speaks of him or of the things that he says or the things that he says he'll do are true. No extra words are needed. When we really want someone to believe what we're saying, we say, I promise, because we want them to believe that we mean it strongly. And the sad truth is that I think we use that phrase, I promise, to emphasize what we really mean because, frankly, we universally accept the fact that uh, every one of us fails at keeping our promises sometimes. And we say, I promise, because we want them to know that we really, 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 really mean it this time. But it's not sad when we talk about God's promises. You know why? Because his nature is truth. He never lies. He always does what he says he'll do. He always has, and he always will. The things that are declared by God and the things that describe God and his actions in Scripture are true. They're true. God said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. All right, I feel good. So, I set out to pick a promise that I could teach about and I had really settled down with the idea that I would delve into the story of the prodigal son as a way to illustrate God's promise to never give up on us. I even have some personal stories to illustrate that, if you can imagine that. Um, but then something happened. Last Saturday, I had an awesome privilege. I got to officiate the wedding of a young man that I've known since he was in about fourth or fifth grade, he and his bride. 
And through the pre-marriage counseling that I did with them, and as well in my message to them at the wedding, uh, I had a really unique opportunity to share a truth with them, a truth about God, essentially a promise of God. And I realized that it was something that uh, I needed to be reminded of as well, as did all of the guests at the wedding. So here it is. God promises, I'll guide you. I'll guide you. God promises to give us guidance when we need to make just and right and wise decisions. He promises to guide us through the hard stuff of life. He promises to guide us when he calls us to do things that are bigger and more difficult than we could possibly do on our own. We see his guidance for all his children throughout Scripture, guiding Abraham away from his home to a new place, guiding Joseph as he went from slave to ruler, guiding Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, and then guiding Moses and all the Israelites through the desert as a cloud by day and literally as a fire by night. We see God guiding David through the valley of the shadow of death and in so many other places in his life. And on and on and on, we see God guiding his people in Scripture. And listen to me, he hasn't stopped. God has not stopped guiding his people. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him or submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. That is awesome news. That is awesome news. Okay, I was a Boy Scout when I was a kid, something for which I am increasingly thankful for as my years unfurl. And as a Boy Scout, I got to do and learn many, many things uh, that had I not been a Boy Scout, I never would have gotten to do. One of which was a multi-day camping trip at Zion National Park in Utah, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And while we were there, we not only got to hike all over the park, traipsing up the, the trail, uh, Weeping Rock Trail, um, scooching out on our bellies over the edge of Angel's Landing, looking down the 1,500-foot sheer drop-off. And yes, when I did that, I spit. You have to. It's kind of required. Um, we got to also do this really cool thing called orienteering. I had never done it before, but I learned this new skill. And orienteering is a set of skills that enable a person to safely and successfully navigate through unfamiliar territory using some tools and techniques, primarily a map and a compass, among other things. Um, by learning to read a topographical map and how to use a compass and measuring the length of your pace and learning how to recognize certain landmarks and utilize them, things like that, you can actually get through a place you've never been before or out of a place that you need to leave, even if there's not a path. Countless stories can be told of hikers and hunters who wound up lost. And in some cases, you can read about the harrowing events that finally led them to their rescue, or in some places, to their demise. One such story took place in 2006. Listen to this story about Brandon and Gina. They were a young couple who had recently begun dating. And in fact, were on their, their fifth date, okay? And Brandon took Gina on an impromptu ride up the aerial tramway in uh, Palm Springs, California, up San Jacinto Mountain. The tram uh, goes from 2,600 feet of elevation up to 8,500 feet of elevation in a matter of about 10 minutes. Now, the mountain peak is actually a little bit higher than that. It's at about uh, 10,800 feet. Um, 804 to be exact, and I know that because I've actually climbed from the bottom of that mountain to the top, another event that I got to do as a Boy Scout, and then I took the tramway back down. Um, the, actually, the highest peak in Southern California is San Gregonio Peak, incidentally, and it's 11,503 feet, and I've also climbed that one, but not with the Boy Scouts. That was with my brother and a couple of friends, and that's another story for another day, but a good one. Um, anyhow, Upon arriving at the top of the tramway, Brandon and Gina 
left the other passengers who all headed off to the gift shop and the restaurant, and they decided to take a stroll to see the views. At first, they wandered along paved pathways, which soon transitioned into gravel. And ultimately, they stepped past the signs that said, please do not leave the path, and uh, were soon captivated by the sound of water in the distance, which tempted them to just stomp straight through the forest floor to go see what they could find. And what they found was something beautiful, a waterfall cascading down through the granite rocks, down the steep cliffs of the mountain. It was beautiful for sure, and they enjoyed their time there. Unfortunately, on their way back to the visitor center, they took a wrong turn. Yep. Well, they, they could hear voices off in the distance, so they knew they weren't far from people. The problem was they couldn't tell what direction the voices were coming from because they were echoing off the rocks in the area. And so they kept walking, thinking they'd find their way back. But eventually they didn't hear voices anymore. Well, one thing led to another, and the faster they hiked and the more they climbed over boulders and down slopes, the more lost they got. It didn't take too long before Gina was afraid and before Brandon was saying, ugh, this date isn't turning out like I'd hoped it would. And eventually it began to get dark. And soon came the time where the two of them realized even though they didn't have the right clothing for it, and they certainly weren't prepared for it, they were spending the night on that mountain. Well, they made it through the night. It got cold, but they made it through, and the next morning they got up, hopeful that they would now be able to find themselves, their, their way back to where they needed to be. Maybe a little embarrassed, but maybe with a great story to tell. Not so. After numerous bad decisions, nearly falling down a rock cliff, getting scraped and bruised on rocky terrain, and having wandered farther and farther into the wilderness, on their third day on the mountain, they thought they'd finally run into some luck. They stumbled upon what looked like someone's camp. Excitedly shouting at the top of their lungs, they hoped to hear someone shouting back from the distance somewhere, but they didn't hear anyone shouting back. And so they decided to do what anybody would do. They started to carefully rifle through the backpack that was lying there. And in it, they found a topographical map of the area printed on fax paper. Now remember, this is, uh, this is 2006. So uh, yeah, printed on that curled up fax paper. And there was a little date on there and they saw that it was today's date. So they were so excited. Somebody is here right now and they're going to find us and they're going to be able to tell us how to get back to where we need to go. That is until they realized that the date on the fax paper was the same day, but a year before. And as they looked further through the backpack, they found a journal. And as they looked through a few of the final entries, they realized that what they had stumbled upon were the belongings of another hiker who had been lost a year before, just like them, but who hadn't made it out. Now they had a map but they had no idea where they were or how to use the map. And they wandered on, hoping that they'd maybe find their way. But soon they realized they couldn't do that either. The ravine that they were walking down just got too steep. And so after spending one more night, they made their way back to the camp uh, and went a little bit further through some of the things that they found around there. And among the items that were there, they found a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag that had Strike Anywhere matches in it, which was a godsend for them. Brandon took the matches. He lit a big, big fire that sent smoke high up into the sky. And before too long, they were saved. A helicopter came and rescued them. And the fate of the gentleman who had been there a year before was finally learned by uh, his loved ones. As someone who really enjoys hiking, it's easy for me to see some of the major mistakes that this couple made as they left a place of safety and uh, entered into places unknown, not realizing that with each decision they made, they distanced themselves further and more distant from where they really wanted to be. 
I think more often than we would like to admit, we do some of the same things that Brandon and Gina did. Maybe not on hikes, but perhaps in other realms of life. Sometimes, as Christ followers, we leave the areas of known safety and take risks that seem to be very small. The alluring appeal of uh, shiny things draw us away from the path. A less than tasteful TV show to binge watch on Netflix during COVID. You know, we can all tell the difference between right and wrong. We're adults, right? But before we know it, we're kind of carelessly laughing at humor or captivated by romance we see in behaviors that we know go absolutely against what God would desire. Or how about the easier route we sometimes take in raising our kids? We know the importance of consistency in our parenting, right? And uh, it, takes, it takes a pace and a discipline, though, to be consistent with kids. And sometimes when we're tired, when we're weary, uh, when kids can tell that we're not paying attention, and they'll push it. And we don't feel like being consistent in that moment. So we'll let it slide just one time. Maybe a second time. But then before we know it, we've allowed an unacceptable behavior to take place and to take hold in our household. Not just to the detriment of our family's culture, but to the detriment of our child, really. Because now they've been allowed to do something that's not okay, and they've allowed it to become habit. And turning back after this has happened seems so difficult, so much harder, really, than just doing it the right way to begin with. Brandon and Gina failed to recognize the value of guidance that was given to them uh, when they were on the path. As the voices they could hear early on in their wandering started to fade, they, they didn't listen to the voices inside of them that, that might have been saying, we should probably sit tight and wait for someone to come rescue us. Instead, they let pride and uh, determination lead them to figure it out on their own. Guess what? Life can get complicated, can't it? I think we've, figured, we've all figured that out by now. But guess what else? We have a guide to lead us through. His name is Jehovah Rohi, our shepherd. Amen. And if you think about it, it's not as though the path God leads us on is a boring one, lacking shiny things, or with no challenges, or without beauty and excitement. If we're completely honest, the path that God leads us along can actually be quite scary and challenging. And situations God allows us to experience with his guidance can at times become or seem nearly impossible on our own. But he guides us. If only we'll have the boldness and faith to follow his lead. The mountaintops he leads us to are the most extraordinary moments of our lives. If we'll simply trust him. The beauty he allows us to gaze upon is as good as it can get as his plan unfolds before us. I have four beautiful grandchildren. And I'll tell you what, watching them grow up in a home where God reigns supreme and where they're learning to live and love while enjoying the safety of the path that God has laid out for them is a beauty that's beyond compare. It really is. It brings a satisfaction to me that's indescribable. And if you're a grandparent, I think you know what I'm talking about. So how does God guide us? What are the map and compass that he has put in our backpack to help us navigate the exciting path that he's laid out for us? Well, our map and our compass are more things than I can possibly cram into this short message. But there are two aspects of God's guidance that really stand clear to me. His word and his messengers. And each of these could easily constitute an entire message on its own. But for practical purposes, I'll practice the five B's. Be brief, brother. Be brief. 
Speaking to my church family, it seems almost silly to state the obvious. God guides us through his word, the Bible. And as a reminder, when I say the Bible, I'm not talking about one book. Although we have it conveniently encapsulated into one bound book, it's actually 66 books written by 40 different authors who were all inspired by the Holy Spirit. They came from three different continents, and they wrote all these scriptures over the course of about 2,000 years, and all of them tell one story. The story of God's creation and the story of our departure from the path that God laid out for us. And it's the story of the redemption that he's provided to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So do you think that the God who created us, watched us walk away, and gave his one and only son to redeem us might also be willing to give us some, some guidance to be on the right path that he's laid out for us? I think so too. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 say, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And in Psalm 119, 105, David says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Obviously, I can't detail all the guidance he provides through scripture, but it is vast. And it's why we look into his word on a weekly basis at church. It's why we promote Bible study in life groups. It's why we suggest you use apps like YouVersion and others on your devices. It's why, well, it's why I bought several cases of uh, adventure Bibles for kids in elementary school and the Jesus Storybook Bible for the younger kids. And by the way, if your child or your grandchild has not gotten theirs yet, hit me up because I have a Bible for them and I want it to be a part of their everyday life. God gives us guidance through his word. And it is good guidance. Another means by which God gives us guidance is through his messengers. And by this, I mean the wise and loving people God puts in each of our lives. Our moms, dads, grandparents, pastors, teachers, siblings, neighbors, friends, sometimes even random people who just step into our life for just that moment when we're, they're needed. God provides guidance through messengers, but it can be a little bit trickier. Um, but it also can be very powerful and an effective way that God uses to get us back on the path or to get us to stay on the path. I say it can be trickier because we have to use discretion when we listen to the advice of others, right? Uh, sometimes people are wrong. Sometimes people aren't grounded in truth. And even though well-intentioned, they might simply lead us from one wrong path onto another wrong path. So when getting advice from others, it's really important to be sure what they're saying squares up with Scripture. If ever somebody tells you something that doesn't line up with Scripture, always stand on the Scripture. God has put in us, thankfully, uh, something that help us to, helps us determine if we're hearing something that's true or not. Even a fool can recognize the difference between a wise word and a foolish suggestion. But if you keep yourself familiar with God's word, you're likely to recognize if somebody's speaking the truth in your current situation. When I was a young man, at the age of 20, I experienced God's guidance through a messenger. It was late August, 1986, uh, and now I had grown up in a solid Christian home and had put my faith in Jesus Christ at a young age. But in my teen years, I learned how to straddle the line, sort of. Uh, you know, I had one foot in two different worlds or on two different paths, we'll say. I was quite involved in my youth group at church. I even sang in the bass section of the youth choir, and we traveled around and uh, sang at different churches and things like that. And I was at church every week. Uh, attending all the things that were going on. But I also was enjoying things, these shiny things on the side of the path. Girls, partying, 
mostly girls, and not the girls from my youth group. These were some other girls. Anyhow, that pattern of jumping back and forth from one path to the other uh, became pretty consistent in my life until one day I realized I wasn't on the church path anymore. I was simply walking my own path. Now, I wasn't a bad guy, but I certainly wasn't following all the awesome opportunities that God had uh, laid out in advance for me. Somehow, and to this day, I still can't figure out how he did it, my big brother convinced me to go attend this three-day event. Um, It was up in the foothills near where we lived at a Christian conference center called Forest Home. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, And it was this event that was for college-age kids. Uh, It was in late August, and the idea was to to just go get charged up and on fire for God before uh, everybody went back to school. My brother didn't even go. I don't know how that worked out. He was working or something. (laughs) But there I was with a bunch of kids who I had grown up with in my church. And uh, and I was kind of watching them all catch fire as we attended these powerful worship sessions. And uh, we listened to this really captivating and um, convicting speaker that was there that week. And uh, on about day two, the Holy Spirit just got right up in my grill. Oh, I can still remember it like it was yesterday. And let me tell you, I felt the conviction of having lived a life for myself for the past couple of years or few years. A life of selfish desire and personal satisfaction and facades and a lot of other things. Um, And I felt literally lost in terms of how to get back onto the right path that I 100% knew was the path God had for me and was the right path for my life. Um, So after having lived the pattern of making one wrong decision after another, I made a right one. I found Jim Gribble. Jim was a young man, probably 30 or so years old, who uh, was a man of strong faith who went to my church and worked with the college-age kids in our church. And he was up there with us. And so I found Jim. I trusted Jim. Uh, Jim was a wise person, I could tell. And I told him, I need to talk. And so we went and found a place uh, to sit down. And I I can just still remember it now. It was one of those little black uh, mesh, wire mesh tables that you see outside of coffee shops. And we sat at this little table and, uh, and I just began to confess all of these things that I had going on in my life or had had going on and, um, and all of these things that I knew I needed to rid my life of. And Jim was a great listener. He listened to me just go on and on. And uh, when I was done, done unloading and downloading all my stuff, Jim had the wherewithal and the courage poke a little harder. (laughs) You see, what I hadn't brought up was the one thing that I wasn't yet ready to deal with. Um, So Jim, being God's messenger, to me, that August day, leaned in and he asked, what about your living situation, Steve? It was the one thing I didn't want to hear. You see, I was in love with a girl. And I had been living with her for some time. And Jim knew it, and all my friends knew it, and nobody confronted me on it until that point. And Jim asked me about it. And I just explained to him, Jim, I'm in love. Uh, I just don't see how I can fix that situation without it costing something greater than I'm willing to to pay. And, And he told me, well, you know, if you want to get right with God, you have to get all the way right with God. So over the next 24 hours or so, I came to grips with the realization that I just couldn't put one foot back on to the right path. I either had to follow God wholeheartedly or not at all. Well, I drove back down the mountain, and when I tried to explain to my girlfriend the next day what had taken place and was taking place in my heart, her reaction was just what I feared. 
She absolutely did not understand what I was talking about. She was angry. She was hurt. Uh, she threw me out. Uh, and needless to say, I was heartbroken. I went back across town to where my parents lived and knocked on their door. And of course, they welcomed me in with open arms. And I was just heartbroken. And they were heartbroken for me. I remember talking to my dad and just saying, Dad, I, I just don't understand. I'm trying to do the right thing. Why does it hurt so bad? And he told me, Steve, right is right. And God heals. And he'll heal you. Well, my dad was right. Right is right. And God did heal. And over the next weeks and months, that girl that I had loved so much met somebody else that I also loved. His name is Jesus. She began to go into church with me. Um, and she was baptized by my awesome pastor, Buster Reeves, somebody I've told you about before. Not only did uh, one of God's messengers help me get back onto the good path that God had planned for me, but God grabbed my girlfriend by the, by the hand and brought her along too. That was 34 years ago now. And today, when I watch her loving on her grandkids, I am simply in awe at the good path that God has laid for me. I'm in awe of the guidance that God gives us. And I'm amazed at how he guides us through thick and thin. I honestly couldn't say it more emphatically. God promises, I'll guide you. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you guide us. That is such an amazing promise. God, you guide us through your word, and we're so thankful for that. Your word is rich, rich with knowledge and direction and conviction and all kinds of lessons. Help us to really get into your word, God, and to understand it and to make it such a, a regular habit to be in your word, that it changes our lives. Thank you, God, for your messengers. Especially, we thank you for the courageous messengers who are willing to say the hard stuff to us. Thank you for putting those people in our lives that can grab us by the hand and say, I love you. Come back onto the path. God, I pray that as you guide us, that you'll also give us the conviction we need to see the wrongness of where we've been going on our own, to see the, the fallacy of shiny things off the path. God, I pray that you give us the courage to make the hard decisions we need to sometimes, either for ourselves or for our families or people we love. And God, I thank you for the victories that you give us along the way. They are awesome victories. And you are awesome, God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. I hope you have a great week.